This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business, or just run a website, whatever, it's Squarespace. Check it out through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. So nearly everyone has grown up hearing the stories of the masked vigilante named Zorro. He's dressed in all black and he fought with a sword to defeat his enemies. Instead of having superpowers, he used his wits and his strength to take down bad guys. He took from the rich and he gave to the poor, just like Robin Hood. This is a fictional character, of course, but Zorro was inspired by the real Mexican-American man named Joaquin Murrieta. On today's biographics, we're going to uncover the life and the legend of this bandit who became a hero. Before we get into the meat of Joaquin Murrieta's life story, it helps to know a bit of a background on the history of California and the political situation at the time. It all started in 1542. There's this Spanish explorer named Juan Rodriguez Cabello who enters San Diego Bay and dubs the new land Alta California. Of course, the Native Americans were already living on this land that everyone was calling the New World, and the Spanish didn't bother to establish their first permanent colony until 1769, and they called it San Diego. The state of California was split up into four military districts, or presidios. A group of Spanish officers were then given huge plots of land for their ranches. These were called the Rancheros. Mexico was also occupied by the Spanish at that time, so hundreds of people walked from Mexico City all the way to San Diego, California, in order to work at these ranches. From 1769 to 1833, a total of 21 Spanish missions were built to attempt converting Native Americans to Christianity. As time went on, more and more Spanish settlements sprung up around these missions, and more immigrants came from Mexico to establish colonies. In 1821, California gained their independence from Spain as Mexican territory, but their victory it was short-lived. The Mexican-American War raged from 1846 to 1848. When the war was over, that territory now belonged to the United States. There was a rumor that California was filled with gold and as the new victors of this massive territory, the Americans did not waste any time making sure that they claimed it all for themselves. Not much is known about the very early life of Joaquin Murrieta, aside from the fact that he was baptized in a Catholic church in 1830. It is likely that he grew up working with his family for one of the rancheros, but he was ambitious and he wanted to become a rich man. So when he was just 18 years old, he and his young wife, they went to live on their own in the mountains so that he could search for gold. This was years before men were traveling around the world to become a part of the California gold rush. He would have been one of the very first Mexican men to discover the gold. He kept it quiet, telling only his wife and his brother about the discovery. We have no way of knowing how much money he was making by prospecting gold, but there was rumor and speculation that spread later on that some of the early miners were finding upwards of $300 a day, and that's before modern inflation meant in modern money. Well, let's just say that that is a lot. Joaquin and his wife, they would have been very happy saving up as much money as they could before starting a family. In 1848, the war was over and the United States won the California Territory. That same year, gold was discovered by a Swiss pioneer named John. Suter, and thus the Great California Gold Rush began. Men traveled from all over the world to try and make it rich. The American government they wanted more people to settle in the new territory and mine the gold so that they could begin to revive the economy. They didn't waste any time at all letting people know that there was gold in California and even went to the extent of over-exaggerating how much men could potentially make. Today we're still not really sure how many people moved there, but estimates say that it was around 300,000 immigrants from the United States and Europe. The only problem was the Mexican men had of course been mining the gold for decades before the Americans got there. One day, Joaquin Marietta and his wife they were approached by a group of American men. They informed him that Mexico had lost the war and they said that he had to give up his gold mine. He refused, of course, because it was his home and that would be giving up his family's entire future. So these men they grabbed Joaquin Marietta and they tied him to a chair. They forced him to watch as they tortured and abused his wife in front of him. Then they killed her and they left Marietta alone in his grief. This 18-year-old boy was still tied to the chair as these men galloped away, taking his entire life savings with them. Eventually, he managed to undo the knots from around his wrists, and he buried his wife. Within just a few moments, this group of men had taken everything that he had worked so hard for, and there was nothing left.
heartbroken and traumatized teenage Joaquin Marietta had no choice but to return to his hometown empty-handed. He had expected to return to his family triumphant in the riches that he had found, but now he had nothing left to his name. When he arrived, he also saw that his home village had transformed in a short period of time. American men were now living there, and the native Mexican people had to be subservient in order to avoid confrontation. He soon learned that he was not alone in the abuse that he had endured. After all, this was the Wild West, and there were few options for Mexican people to receive any kind of help from law enforcement. In the minds of the Americans, they were the victors of the war, and that gave them the right to the land, even if Mexican families had been living near the rancheros and the missions for decades. Many of these American men they were also veterans, and to some, it didn't matter if these Mexican people were civilians. They were still considered to be the enemy. Joaquin Marietta knew that if he wanted to survive, he would need to integrate into the new society that was being put in front of him. He began working as a car dealer at a local saloon for the cowboys who were looking to play blackjack and poker. But even though he tried to keep his head down, he was still constantly harassed by the white men. Over the next two years, the situation had only grew worse for Mexican Americans living in California. After the Compromise of 1850, California was bringing a lot of new money into the U.S. economy and its population it was large enough to be officially declared a state. That same year, California legislation passed the Foreign Miners Act, which charged men $20 a month in taxes for anyone who wanted to mine gold. With modern inflation, this was more like $1,000 a month, and it made it far too expensive for your average worker to actually make a living. This caused gold miners to revolt, and many men became desperate for money, and there was a lot of tension in these local communities. More and more white people began resorting to stealing from the Mexicans in order to make ends meet. Eventually, the government could see that their tax laws were only causing chaos, so they exempted all all free white men from being considered foreigners, even if they were European immigrants. They also reduced the tax from $20 down to a much more reasonable $3 a month. Indeed, there were far more entrepreneurs who were able to make a fortune from selling products to gold prospectors instead of having the get-rich-quick mindset. For example, the Levi Jean Company began because the founder Levi Strauss was able to sell pants to prospectors who kept getting holes in their clothes. Of course, the company it still exists today, and its value is about $6.6 .6 billion. Many of the men who traveled for the gold rush, they died from disease or they left penniless. Just like Levi Strauss and his trousers, entrepreneurs were making much more money than the gold prospectors. Mexican business owners were able to make lots of money from the tourists who were coming through town. Even though Joaquin Marietta had lost everything, he was still ambitious. His brother was also clever and business savvy, so he was able to earn enough money to purchase a beautiful horse. Back then, having a high-quality horse was like driving a luxury sports car. It was a sign of wealth and of status. So when the Americans noticed a Mexican riding one, they were incredibly jealous, especially since they were struggling to make it rich in the gold rush. They couldn't believe that a Mexican man could actually afford it, so they accused Joaquim's brother of being a horse thief. Back then, being a horse thief, it was an extremely serious crime, punishable by death. Joaquin Marietta tried to defend his brother, saying that he had purchased the horse legally. The men, they chose to punish him for just speaking up and telling the truth. They tied Marietta up and whipped him bloody. Then the American men, they lynched Marietta's brother in the town square, even though he was innocent of any crime. Now, for the second time, the white men had killed someone that Joaquin loved dearly. At this point, the two closest people in his life had been taken from him, and it was clear that even if he tried to work hard and make a living through honest means, the extreme racism that now ruled over California would continue to keep him down, no matter how hard he tried to better himself. This young, ambitious part of Joaquin Marietta it was now dead. He had transformed into someone who would devote his life to revenge. But rather than devoting your life to revenge, why not set up a website for your personal life or your business with Squarespace? And yes, I'm aware that makes no sense whatsoever, but here we are, and I'm going to tell you a bit about Squarespace before we get into the next half of today's video. Now, sponsors like Squarespace genuinely do make what we do here possible, so, you know, if you've even thought about getting a website, you thought, hmm. I sure would love a website, and I sure would love it if Simon and crew got a kickback from that website. While well, this is the way you can make that happen, capitalism at work, people. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful online identity for yourself, your brand, your business. And look, I don't know who you are. I, I'm sure I would like to, but you're on the other side of this camera, and you know maybe you don't need a website. But 
look, if you if you got a business of any variety, if you're a person, if you're looking for a job, right, and you go to search your name into Google, and there's just that weird serial killer guy from Ohio that comes up because he shares your name, that's not a good thing. Employers they want to be able to find you and your profiles, and a great way to increase your presence online is with a website. So get a Squarespace website, make it for you. If you're looking for a job, if you're like a professional and you do stuff, you need a website. And you can do that with Squarespace. They make it super easy. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content. Or you can start from scratch or just easily move it over from an existing domain. I don't even know how that works. I just started from scratch, although I used template because my design skills are pretty rubbish. And once you've gone through the super easy customization process, there's no updates, there's no patches, there's no tech BS that you have to deal with. No one likes tech BS. And look, Squarespace handles all of that websitey stuff. If you want to do a podcast, a mailing list, social integrations, it's all there and much more. 24-7 customer support as well, if you've ever got a question. And Squarespace isn't just about an online presence. You can totally sell stuff and services on their sites as well. Look, if you're looking to start a business or outrank that serial killer in Google, Squarespace is a great way to do that. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics and save 10% off a website or a domain. And guys, please do use our link. It really does make a difference. It means that we can keep making these videos. I appreciate it. The team appreciate it. And let's get back to it. The day after his brother's lynching, Joaquin Marietta completely snapped. He felt that he had nothing left to lose, and he was ready to get revenge, even if it meant risking his own life. Joaquin waited until the middle of the night, and he kidnapped the man who was responsible for his brother's death. Then he murdered the man using a blade and chopped up the body. He left pieces lying around the camp so that the American men would find their friend in the morning. One of the men in the camp could hear something going on, so he walked outside to see his friend's body parts scattered around the camp. He ran to catch the killer. The only light it came from the flames of the campfire and they spotted Joaquin Marietta. They recognized him as the young man that they had whipped earlier that day and he was the brother of the man who was killed. He was dressed in all black so it was difficult to see in the darkness but they could see the whites of his eyes and they were filled with rage. Before they could react, Marietta was already riding away on a horse. The men shot after him, but none of the bullets came into contact with him. Clearly, the men must have missed. But according to their version of the story, it was as if Joaquin had some superhuman quality about him that helped him escape unscathed. The men, they were terrified, and they had good reason to be. Every night, another one of them would be found dead with their body parts scattered around the camp. Even when they were on the lookout for Marietta, he still somehow managed to slip in and slaughter his next victim. Word spread that there was a phantom-like bandit coming for revenge on behalf of the Mexican people. At first, Joaquin Marietta was only killing the white men, who were responsible for his family, but that was not enough for him. He began hearing stories from other Mexican people who had been abused, and he decided to go after the men who were the most violent rapists and murderers. He was passing judgment on them like the Grim Reaper, deciding when it was time for them to die. Marietta was serving vigilante justice as he saw fit, and he had no guilt or remorse for doing so. At this point, Joaquin Marietta was technically just a cold-blooded serial killer, but the Mexican people had been beaten down for so long that everyone saw him as a hero. Finally, the white men were afraid of being cruel to the Mexicans because they were afraid of getting on Marietta's hit list. It did not take long for other young people seeking revenge to step up and offer help to Joaquin Marietta. A gang of men and women, they began to look up to this man as their leader. All of them were in their 20s and 30s, and they had similar tragic backstories to Marietta. The Americans had killed their family, taken their money, and their homeland for themselves. Since many of these young people had lost their families, they decided to call themselves the Mariettas. One of the most memorable members of the gang was named Manuel Garcia, but everyone there called him Three Finger Jack because, well, as you might imagine, he only had three fingers. There was also a 16-year-old boy named Reyes Feliz and his older sister. Their parents had been killed, and they had nothing left to live for except revenge. Joaquin Marietta fell for Feliz's sister, and they became lovers who were both willing to avenge the families that they had lost. After a while, the gang had killed all of the men who were responsible for ruining their lives, but they did not stop their life of crime. They became like a troop of Robin Hood's merry men. The gang members would travel through San Joaquin and Sacramento valleys, lassoing white men. They would steal their gold and take their horses before riding off with their treasure. In their minds, they were really just taking back the gold that had been taken from them in the first place and rebelling against their oppressors. Upon returning home to their villages, the gang was met with cheers, and people were finally able to rebuild their lives after having everything taken away from them. However, since they were only killing when it was absolutely necessary and left many of these men alive, it left plenty of witnesses who were able to report the theft to the authorities. Eventually, they demanded help 
from the California Rangers. The name Wild West is very fitting for good reason. In the New American territories, there were plenty of areas that were totally lawless. The California Rangers were tasked with being the state's law enforcement, but they would only be sent out on location for the most serious cases. Once word spread that a Mexican serial killer and his gang of bandits were murdering white men around the gold rush, the governor of California offered a $6,000 cash reward for Joaquin Murrieta. He was now wanted dead or alive. Now, $6,000 might not sound like a ton of money for a group of men to split over killing a bad guy, but keep in mind that with inflation, this is closer to about $200,000 today. This was more than enough incentive for the Rangers to assemble and try and find him. A man named Harry Love was the head of the California Rangers. For several weeks, they tried and failed to find Joaquin Murrieta. This was especially difficult considering that several other desperados were also named Joaquin. Finally, they kidnapped Joaquin Murrieta's brother-in-law and tortured him until he gave up the location of where the gang was hiding. In 1853, the California Rangers rode out to the location where the men had been spotted and shot all eight members of the Murrieta gang. After examining the bodies, they saw the famous three-fingered Jack, and this is how they confirmed that they had in fact, found the right group of people. The only problem was that no one actually knew what Joaquin Murrieta actually looked like. There were plenty of illustrations of him circulating about, but they were all artistic renderings of a maniacal-looking Mexican with crazy eyes. However, Harry Love claims that he was confident that he could identify the leader, Joaquin Murrieta. Therefore, he cut off the body's head, preserved it in a jar of liquor, and carried it home with him. He then put the head on display and charged people $1 per ticket to see it. As morbid as it sounds, people came from all around to stare at the head of the dead bandit who had been terrorizing California. Yeah. Just one year later, in 1854, a writer named John Rollin Ridge published a book called The Life and Adventures of Joaquin Murrieta, the Celebrated California Bandit. The author, Ridge, also went by the name Yellowbird because of his Cherokee heritage. It was important to him to document the story of Joaquin Murrieta from the perspective of the Mexican-American people because it was an example of the atrocities that native people had to endure after the United States occupied the California Territory. Without his book, the true backstory may have never been told, and he would have gone down in history as nothing but a cold-blooded killer. The story of Joaquin Murrieta has been retold multiple times since then, but Yellowbird's version is still considered to be the most accurate portrayal. Unfortunately, this was not the end of the oppression against the Mexican people in America, though. In 1855, the Greaser Act became law. Back then, Americans called Native Americans Indians, and Mexican people were called Greasers because of the perception that they were dirty. It gave Americans the right to arrest Native people for being vagrant. The definition of a vagrant it was very vague, and it could just mean someone who was considered loitering or traveling from place to place. This was meant to cut down on gang activity by the Mexican desperados, but it was also targeted at forcing Native Americans to stay in their reservations, limiting their ability to travel. Because of the Greaser Law, any Mexican or Native American man could be thrown in jail for 90 days simply by standing around town or going on a vacation. This took away the ability for anyone except white men to search for gold in California, and it limited their opportunities for growth in the local communities. As the years went on, it only gave more and more power to the anglo american American economy. The story of Marietta's vigilante justice was so compelling that people began to tell it over and over again throughout the West. In 1919, a writer named John McCulley wrote a short story called The Curse of Capistrano. This was based on the true story of Joaquin Marietta, only he changed the name of the main character to Don Diego Vega. The story was so popular, it was turned into a movie in 1920. As time went on, the legend of Zorro transformed whenever people needed that spark of inspiration. In the 1930s, people were suffering through the Great Depression, and they blamed the 1% for ruining their livelihood. People of all races began to feel that they resonated with the character of Zorro because they wanted to believe that there could be justice in the world. Through Zorro, they could live vicariously and see someone who took from the rich and gave to the poor. By the 1950s, the character was still just as popular as ever, and from 1957 to 1959, Walt Disney Pictures aired the show Zorro on TV. Then, in 1998, the Mask of Zorro premiered, starring Antonio Banderas. But the inspiration it didn't stop there. Author Bob Kane credits the legend of Zorro for the inspiration for the Batman comics, and Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride shares some clear influences as well. And it all started back with Joaquin Marietta. 
For a man who inspired so much popular culture, you might be wondering, is there a grave where we can pay homage to this bandit hero? Well, it turns out there never was one. In 2005, a filmmaker named John J. Valadez went on a quest to find the head of Joaquin Marietta that Harry Love kept on display. After 10 years of searching, Valadez believes that he truly did find the head of Joaquin Marietta, and he filmed a documentary about his entire journey on how he tracked it down. In 2015, he finally gave the man a proper burial, 162 years after his death. Even though Joaquin Murrieta has inspired so many people, there are still many American historians who refuse to see him as a good guy. They say that he was nothing but a criminal and a bandit who terrorized unsuspecting Americans. But in Mexican history, it is clear that Joaquin Murrieta is, and always will be, a hero. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe. Brand new videos four times a week. Uh, also, when you're subscribing, hit the notification bell so you actually do find out when we put out a new video. And as always, thank you for watching.